Learn about how to research your African-American ancestors in the U.S. today in this Footnotes episode. Hey, welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. If this is your first time here, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family history research. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. There is a website, a newsletter, and a Facebook page. Links for all of that are in the show notes below. Now, this is a footnotes episode, and I like to call them footnotes because it's in the footnotes where the real sources are, and today's real source is Renata Yarborough Sanders. She is a genealogist, a speaker, a blogger, a panelist on Black Pro Gen Live, which you'll find on social media, as well as the co-host of the YouTube series, Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. Now, she has a personal connection to this subject because she descends from former enslaved ancestors, as well as enslavers and free people of color. She knows her stuff, and she is here today to share the records and strategies for finding your African-American ancestors. I am so glad you're here. I am super excited to do this. Uh, this is a subject that I need to learn more about. So I am just thrilled uh, to have you here. So welcome. Well, thank you. And I'm very excited to be here also. It's always great to be able to share information. Yes. And mm-hmm. you know, it's funny because I get a lot of questions uh, about how to research our African-American history. And And so this is a a great opportunity to educate everybody. And so, well, let's just jump into it. I know you have some slides that you're going to share with us. Well, we'll get started. Here we go. So I'm here today to talk about researching ancestors of color. And again, I am Renata Yarbrough Sanders. Very happy to be here today. Um, Typically, when I start this type of presentation, I do all the proper things with sharing the goals for the presentation and giving some background. But because we are kind of going to be talking about all aspects of, and and I must clarify when I say ancestors of color, I am specifically talking about those with African heritage, so African American ancestors. I'm going to leave all that out and kind of do it as we go along. Um, So we're ready to just get started. So first of all, the first steps for researching any ancestors of color are exactly the same as they are for anyone researching anyone. The first thing you want to do is just think about what you already know. I suggest that people start with a good old fashioned notebook or notepad of some type that they are going to just kind of do a brain dump and what ever you know about that line of your ancestry, uh, just go ahead and write it down. It doesn't need to be organized in any way. Um, If you're absolutely opposed to pencil and paper, then you can do the same thing with an electronic um, device and just do a, a note or a document of some type where you just dump every single thing out of your brain that you know about your ancestry. So that's the first step, no matter who you are researching. And then you want to begin with yourself, just like with any research and work your way backwards. You'll be creating a tree or a pedigree chart as you're doing this, showing yourself and your ancestors as far as you know them. Now, the biggest difference between doing a tree and doing a pedigree chart is that if you do a pedigree chart, you are only going to be uh, documenting your direct line ancestry. Whereas if you do a tree, you're not only documenting your direct ancestry, but also any spouses and any um, children that those couples may have had along the way. And so it's just a fuller picture of your family history. Then you want to, once you've gotten all the names down that you already know, you want to start to interview family members, especially beginning with the elders for reasons that should be obvious. Um, You know, none of us is guaranteed tomorrow, but when you are older, you have an increasing likelihood of something happening to take you away from us. So um, it's best to get to those elders. And something a lot of people don't think about is not only the elders, but also if you have family members who may have some type of uh, illness or um, anything that could be uh, life-threatening that makes it uh, 
more urgent for you to get to those relatives, then you want to interview them first also. I highly encourage using uh, audio video recordings if possible. You don't need any fancy equipment. If you have a cell phone, then it's gonna do what you need to do to either do an audio recording or to make a video of your, um, and I need to turn mine off, and make a video of your uh, interview. Amen. I can't tell you how often I profess that very same thing because uh, it, when you record an interview with a family member and you think, oh God, this is a pain in the butt to do. And, you know, I mean, just to go through it, but do it because yes. you will cherish those videos later. Absolutely. I've actually lost some that I did in my early days when we used to have the, um, the little digital camera that you would put the S video, the S card into. I've lost a couple of S cards along the way, and I have some really cherished videos on there with people who are not with us anymore. So um, I really am glad we just have the phone that we just can't seem to lose anything from the phone these days. And of course, make sure you're uploading what you have on your phone to your computer or to a jump drive of some type so that you have a secondary resource for that. Exactly. Back up, back up, back up. Yes. Um, so the next step, um, and kind of along the, probably along the same time that you're doing these interviews, is you want to begin to access some of the free online um, databases. And if, it, if you're able, because we are in COVID right now, to go to some of your local libraries or family history centers and see what resources they have available for you there to begin to be to begin to find records about the people that you already have on your tree. And then we're gonna come back to this towards the end of the presentation, but as you're researching, it's really important to begin to create timelines for each of your ancestors. Now, I usually say direct ancestors. There are people who wanna create timelines for everybody on the tree. For me, I kind of keep that to my direct ancestors, or if you have a particular uh, collateral ancestor of interest to your family research, then you want to create a timeline for that person also. So before we start to talk about records that are particular in some way to um, your people of color research, I want you to remember that at the beginning for all of us, we kind of all start with just regular vital records having to do with birth, marriage, death, and sometimes military. And so I just threw a couple of examples on here. There's nothing really special about any of these. This is a birth register from Franklin County, North Carolina, where um, as you can see, there are a lot of Yarboroughs because <laughs> this is just one of many pages of Yarboroughs. And that is of course, part of my paternal uh, ancestry. Uh, you're seeing a lot of my folks right here on this page. So these are um, birth registers. They're going to give you the information about uh, at least one parent's name. I find that uh, in the older days, mostly the father's name was recorded. But as you see, as you kind of scan around down here, you know, you may occasionally see the name of the mother. Uh, there's a, a Harriet right there. And then I know this isn't very clear, but it's really just for the purpose of, of um, demonstration, marriage records. And both of these records are from North Carolina, but you will find this to be true in most states that on marriage records, you will find the parents' names for the bride and groom. And a lot of times that marriage record is taking you back a generation as far as providing names for you that you did not know. So this one is from Halifax County, North Carolina, and it's showing the parents' names for the bride and groom. So after you've gotten through all the vital records and you've worked your way backwards for this ancestor, you know, as I said, start with yourself and start wherever you can for the ancestor that you're targeting and work backwards. So if they lived beyond 1870, then you probably have some information about them that wasn't very hard to get. But that information that came from mostly those vital records is going to help steer you as you get to what is commonly known as the 1870 brick 
wrong. Now, I don't tend to call it that because in my 23 years of research, I have learned how to break that wall down. And so, you know, I never, I don't see it as a brick wall anymore. I just see it as a, almost like a starting point for certain kinds of research. And that's what we'll be talking about. So we're going to talk about what to do once you've walked back and you've gotten to 1870. So this is just a, a quick look at a census or, or a snippet of a census record showing my third great grandparents, one set of them who were in uh, Warren County, North Carolina, um, showing them in the 1870 census. This is the first time that they appear in any census records. And I'm going to explain to you why that's important. So you want to look for your ancestors in the 1870 census because this was the first federal census taken after emancipation. It's the first time that all people, including all people of color, are going to be enumerated by name in a federal census. So I use this for to establish baseline data about the ancestor or ancestors that I'm looking at to see how they're identifying themselves after emancipation or five years after emancipation. And believe me, they're, they're, there's some wiggle room because in that five years, they may have changed their names. They may have changed their locations. They may have changed their spouses. So there's no, nothing's written in stone about 1870. You're just going to be recording what they said in 1870. So you use the 1870 to establish the age, location, household family members of your ancestor. You also want to study the neighborhood, what we call cluster research, to look for any known family members or potential family members. Now, how do you know if they're potential family members? Well, you do want to look for common surnames, but you have to be careful with that because not all uh, formerly enslaved family members took the same surname. So you could have brothers living next door to each other who have different surnames. If you already know that, then you can collect, you know, collect those names, but just give it a good microscopic look, uh, a few pages forward and a few pages back from where you found your ancestor. And if you do happen to see common surnames, white or black, make note of those. You also want to look for households that have similar forenames, being first names. So for instance, if you see a household and it has um, people in the household named Arthur, Renata, Henry, and Edgar, which is myself and my siblings, and the, and the last name is Yarborough, but then three or four households down, you see another household with an Arthur, Renata, Henry, and Edgar, but they have a different last name, hold on to that because this could very well be uh, a family of cousins or even sib children of siblings who are naming their children after the same grandparents, you know, uncles, aunts, because family naming patterns were used by both blacks and whites during this time period. And also it's just really important to know that formerly enslaved people did not always take the surname of their last owner. That's a myth that is very much incorrect. And then as I already mentioned, family members didn't always use the same surnames. So just because you see someone with a surname the same as a, um, a white uh, former slave owner, that doesn't mean that was their former slave owner. You have to do the work to find that out. So you've, you've Dot, you've dug into that 1870 and you've notated everything you can about it, about your ancestor. So what do you do next? Okay, so you're finished with the 1870 and the next thing you want to do now is to check the 1860 and the 1850 census looking for that same ancestor or ancestors. And the reason you want to do that is because in 1850 and 1860, all free persons, regardless of color, were to be enumerated in the federal census. So you want to be able to establish whether or not your ancestors were 
perhaps free people of color because by 1860, almost 11% of the African-American population were free. So go ahead and check that 1850 and 1860. Now, if your ancestors of color do not appear in either the 1850 or the 1860 census records, this increases the likelihood that they were enslaved. And so you're now at what I kind of call not a brick wall, but the 1870 fork in the road. You either are going to now go with plan A for your research, which is going after uh, someone who you believe to probably have been enslaved because you don't see them anywhere before 1870, or plan B, someone who you have found in the 1850 and, and or 1860 census to have been a free person of color. So once you make that determination, your research takes a certain path. Now, before we begin to look at those two paths, there are a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. First of all, from this point now on into your research, it's all about the documents. So when you are pulling documents, finding documents about your ancestors, you have to look at them with a critical analytical eye and work very hard to make sense of what you see. You have to read every single word on that document and really dissect it for all the information it's going to be giving you. So you're gonna use census records and any other data that you find wisely so that it builds your research for you. Also, pay attention to who signs documents as witnesses or any other names that are on the documents where you find your ancestors. These are people that are probably in what's known as your ancestors fan club, friends, associates, and neighbors. And these are people who you will also want to research to see what, if any, connection they have to your family and if maybe they could be family members too. The other thing is to be sure you understand the laws of the time. All of us who are doing this research and we're going back you know, into the 1700s, the 1800s, even the 1900s, things are happening that are um, inspired or instigated by what the laws are of the time. So as you're finding records about your ancestors, you want to understand the context of why they're doing what they're doing. So especially property laws, laws of coverture, which have to do with um, the rights of women to own property uh, and how being married or not married affects the wife, the, the woman's ability to own property. And you also need to be aware of the slave codes that were put into place and any other laws related to slavery. All of these are going to impact your understanding of your, your uh, ancestral research. And I should have also put on this slide laws pertaining to free people of color, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So we're going to start off looking at the path of the, the fork in the road that goes towards slave ancestral research. One of the first types of documents that you might find yourself using um, would be the United States Federal Slave Schedules. Now, these were only um, used in 1850 and in 1860. Um, prior to that, you can also use the actual census to determine if, an, if a white ancestor or a white person you're looking at was a slave owner. But the value of these in 1850 and 1860 is you're going to have to begin by trying to find out who owned your enslaved ancestor. Or if you're still trying to figure out if they were enslaved, you're gonna look at people who may have had the same surname unless you know something different uh, that would guide you to a different surname uh, as your ancestor. On these documents, slaves were enumerated individually, but not by name. Uh, they were usually just numbered and then distinguished by age, sex, and color under the name of the slave owner. Uh, sometimes though, lucky for a few people who are doing this work, the enumerators did list the given names of the enslaved. 
Now they were supposed to do that if the enslaved person was 100 years or older, but we have found a few cases in a few locations where the enumerator actually did put in uh, the actual names of the enslaved. So if you're lucky enough to find one of those, then that document becomes even more valuable for you. But initially this document is really being used just to identify slave owners so that you can kind of start to narrow down potential owners for your ancestors. Other questions on the um, slave schedule were whether or not the person was a fugitive from the state, meaning a runaway, um, the number of enslaved people this particular owner had freed, and then a notation whether a particular enslaved person was considered to be deaf and dumb, blind, insane, or idiotic. In 1860, one category was added to the slave schedule and that was the number of slave houses that this particular owner had. So this is what the slave schedule looks like. Uh, this one is from 1860. And as you can see, only the names of the enslavers are given. And then they get the tick marks for the enslaved people, the ages, the gender, the race, and that would either be black or mulatto, like here's a mulatto right here. And then these are the other categories I, I mentioned, the fugitive uh, and the emancipated. And then over here, and this is the deaf, dumb, blind, or insane. And then over here is the number of slave houses. What I like about the number of slave houses is it kind of can give you an idea of what the living conditions may have been if someone owned 55 enslaved people and they only had five slave houses, then you know that they're living in more crowded conditions. But if they had 55 enslaved people and they had 10 slave houses, then you know that those enslaved people may have had some better living conditions. And this is just an example, a close up of what one of these looks like. I don't know anybody on this. This is just a, a one that I chose to use. But you can see that the slave owner is named Solomon Batchelor and then his enslaved population is listed. Now, just um, as a disclaimer, a caveat, I want to make sure everyone understands that you can only use these slave schedules to help support your findings on other documents. You cannot at any time just look at a slave schedule and see that someone owned a 65 year old black male and you know that your great great grandfather that year should have been 65 years old and he was a black male. You can't say that's my grandfather. You cannot do it unless perhaps you have supporting information as I do on some of my um, research where at, in the same year at the same time, you may have an inventory that names your great grandfather and he's 65 years old at that time and it matches the time that the slave schedule. That's the closest you can come to saying that's him. And even then I would just say that's probably him. So everybody needs to understand that unless someone is named, you cannot say that this is the person that you um, are looking at. Another type of record that is very valuable to slave ancestral research where they exist are cohabitation records. Uh, this is an example from Warren County, North Carolina, and it's easy to read because it's a pre-typed document where the names just have to be filled in. You might remember the, the, the snippet from the 1870 census that I showed you of my third great grandparents, Everett and Minerva Ross. This is their cohabitation record. And so whereas I started off suspecting that they had been enslaved, you know, because they never, I never saw them before 1870, Further research led me to this document, which confirmed that they were enslaved, where it tells me that um, they were uh, lately slaves, but now emancipated. And so after I found this document, there was no question that I was on the path of researching enslaved ancestors. Before you go on. Sure. Can I ask real quick, um, just for those at home who might not be familiar with what a cohabitation record is, could you quickly explain that? Most certainly, and I'm sorry, because I meant to. Um, so after the Civil War, um, we had a nation full of formerly enslaved people who had been 
living, you know, as married couples, in many cases, they'd had ceremonies, they jumped the broom, or they, and sometimes were even married by clergy or by whoever their former master was. But these were not legal marriages, because it was illegal. There was, there was no legal slave marriage. So after emancipation, you have these families that are being headed by couples that consider themselves married, but they'd never had a legal, you know, a legal marriage. So um, thank you to the efforts of the Freedmen's Bureau. They were, um, they were brought forth and their unions were recorded. And it was kind of done differently in each state and even in each county within the state. So this one shows you kind of the most basic information that was taken, which shows that they were formerly enslaved, but they now cohabitate together as man and wife. So now, you know, they're not just a, an enslaved couple, they are man and wife. And this one will, uh, in North Carolina, almost all of them will give you the date of the commencement of their union. So for this couple, there's no day given, but they knew that it was in December of 1846. So they had been together at this point for 20 years since December of eight, or almost 20 years since December of 1846. Um, I have uh, another set of uh, ancestors who knew the exact date that they were joined together. And that tells me that they must have had some kind of a ceremony or you know something special since they knew the exact date. In North Carolina and in Virginia, this was taken kind of off the hands of the Freedmen's Bureau because the General Assembly in both states um, put it into law that the formerly enslaved had to come forth and give this information. And so we actually in Virginia and North Carolina have state level, well, they're still county level, but it was mandated at the state level that these be done. Now in Virginia, the cohabitation records are much more information filled. Unfortunately, it's really hard to find one that's any clearer than this. So believe me, I looked and looked and looked. So I'm going to just tell you about it a little bit. It has the name and it has the age and the place of birth of the bride and groom, as well as their current residence, their occupation, and this cool bit of information right here, the last owner. It also has the last owner's residence. Oh, very cool. So we... I think there's only one county I know of in North Carolina. I, I now hope I'm not wrong, but I believe it's Caswell County that gives this kind of information. But all of the Virginia counties give you this kind of information. Unfortunately, though, I live in Virginia. I don't have any Virginia ancestry. All of my ancestry is North Carolina. But it does this for the groom, and then it does it again for the bride. So the, of course, for those of us doing this research, that last owner piece is just like manna from heaven. So it, 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 it's, it's just absolutely wonderful. And then the other thing that happens in Virginia is they name the children. So oh, the fabulous. children that these couple have given birth to are named on the cohabitation record and then the date of the cohabitation, you know, when their cohabitation began uh, is also listed. So if you are um, doing slave ancestral research in Virginia, look for the, well, for anywhere really, but especially in Virginia, look for these cohabitation records. Good to know. It's wonderful. So we're still looking at the types of documentation that is available for formerly enslaved ancestors. And I have to tell you, Connie, there almost needs to be a part two to this because I am using some selected documents, kind of the easier ones to get to for people who are just getting started. But the list of available resources for documenting our formerly enslaved ancestors is so long. There are, there's so much more than I'm able to get into this presentation. So we might have to come back, you know, down the road with a part two for the intermediate researcher. And, Anytime you want to come yeah, back, you are more than welcome. <laughs> Thank you. 
So now we're going to talk about estate files and probate records, because this is, again, where you're going to find a lot of meat with, re with regard to formerly enslaved ancestors. Don't forget, you are researching the records of the slave owner, because our enslaved ancestors, unfortunately, were property. And where do you find information about any property you own, your car, your home, your anything? you find that information under the name of the person who owns it. So, you know, you can drive your husband's car all you want, but DMV has him, if it's his car, they only have his name on the records. And the same is true for people who owned other human beings. So we look at um, estate files and probate records. And as we're doing that, we want to systematically study these records of if you're still trying to determine who the slave owner was of anyone in the area who has the same surname as your enslaved in, uh, ancestor. Now you may have additional information. You may know already that your, your ancestor had a name change or that where they were in 1870 was not where they had been in 1865. So for you, you'll have to you know, fine tune your research with what you know. This is for people who don't know anything else. Like when I started out, I didn't know anything about my ancestors. So I began looking at Yarboroughs in Franklin County, North Carolina, and there were 30 estate files for Yarboroughs prior to the time of emancipation. So I had to look at all of them. And this included variations on the spelling of the name. So you have to include anything that sounds like the same name, or you know, maybe you have found records of your ancestor later in 18, after 1870 with different spellings. You want to include all those spellings. So I had Yarbrough, 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 Zarbrough, 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 and there was even a Garborough with the G. <laughs> and so- You know, in that case too, it could be transcription interpretation mm -hmm. to make that Z a Y, you know? Yes. Sometimes it was, and sometimes that was actually the way the family spelled it, but they really were related to Yarboroughs also. Um, you also want to narrow this research to a span of the years during which your ancestor would have lived. A lot of people don't think about that. You know, if your ancestor was born in 1850, why are you looking for him in 1830? You, you know, he's not, don't look at anybody's estate file from 1830 because he didn't exist yet. So that's just something that a couple of years ago, I said it out loud to someone who was a really, you know, experienced researcher, but they were kind of like, oh, that makes sense, you know, so don't do work that you don't have to do. For the purpose of trying to find a, a connection to someone as enslaved, you want to begin roughly with 1865 deaths and work backwards. And the reason for that is because after that point, these estate files and these probate records are not going to have any enslaved ind individuals in them. So you can eliminate files, at least initially, for people who died after 1865. But there will be some cases where if you have not found what you needed prior to 1865, where it is a good idea to stretch your search into the reconstruction years um, just in case there may have been a relationship maintained between a former slave owner and a formerly enslaved person, and they might leave them land, or it could actually be their own child. They may mention in a, a later will that this person used to be uh, enslaved by them. So you, I certainly wouldn't rule it out, but I just wouldn't start there. So we're going to look at some of the different types of estate records that we'll be using for slave ancestral uh, research. And these are found in civil court. There would be wills, inventories, bills of sale, uh, div and division of property. And what you see here on the screen is uh, one way that an inventory may have been taken, this is the nicest, neatest, cleanest way and easiest to read. And you can see that in this person's inventory, they list out um, whether the person was a man or a boy or a woman, and they give the name and they tell how old they are and how they are valued. This is another way that an inventory is taken. Um, this is actually the child of one of my 
great grandfather's uh, initial owners. And you can see here, this is Leonidas Neal in Franklin County, that he in his inventory has 31 Negroes with the following names and they're actually all listed by their first names. They're listed right along with the long corn and the short corn and the fodder and shucks and cotton and hogs and cattle. That's just sad. It's just the way it was. And usually you will find the enslaved people listed first in the property inventory. Uh, it's you can't it's not 100 percent of the time, but it is most of the time. And I guess I should say that that's what I have found in North Carolina, since that's where the majority of my research is taking place. Would it be fair to say that most of these slaveholders had wills because they wanted to prove their property? And, you know, I don't I don't know actually what the percentage is, because I have found probably maybe just as many, if not more, who died and tested than didn't. And then so the everything would have to be done by division and petitions. Um, yeah. Often the family members would petition for the property. And that in itself raises another set of documents for researchers. And I, I didn't even include it in this um, beginning level uh, presentation but you will find petitions for the property of someone who died and tested family members trying to get that property. Boy, if you're fortunate enough to find the will and estate records, um, I know it can be really helpful because especially in, in this situation here, uh, they're, they're naming their um, slaves by first name at least. Yes. Um, you know, whereas on a lot of the census records, you don't get that much. No, you don't. Well, you, you, you won't get that at all on census records. Um, and, you know, there's also a myth that slaves didn't have surnames, uh, enslaved people didn't have surnames. Now on this particular uh, inventory, I don't see any surnames, but you, you will often find that surnames were absolutely being used prior to emancipation. Uh, in particular, if an enslaver had uh, purchased or even, um, you know, gotten through death, through air property, some uh, enslaved person from someone else more, more than likely than they have the surname of that someone else. So if I go and I buy um, giraffe from Connie Knox, then in my papers, you will always see giraffe listed as giraffe Knox which means I got giraffe from Connie Knox. So that's kind of, Boy, <laughs> I can't believe I just did that. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move got, on because we, we, we have a long way to go. So let's keep going. Um, also in a state record, you will, as Connie just asked about, you will find actual wills. So this is the will of Mrs. Mary. I, I've been fussing with myself about it, but I think it's Chipman of um, Talladega, Alabama, Talladega County, Alabama. And you can see that in her will, she leaves to her beloved son, Matthew Turner, her Negro man, Albert, and her Negro girl, Anne. Now she also leaves the mules, the cattle, the hogs. So it's the same way as what you saw in the inventory. Uh, it, the same thing happens in a will. And then for um, her beloved son, Edward, Edwin Childs Turner, she leaves her Negro man named Isaac along with a bed of, bag of bed clothing. So, you know, again, it's property. Another thing you can find in estate records are bills of sale. You can find re uh, receipts for bills of sale. Here we have from Richmond, Virginia, an 1854, res uh, an 1854 uh, receipt for $650 where Joseph Anderson has purchased uh, two uh, Negro slaves named Martha and her child Edward. There's also some um, information. Um, let me go back for a minute down here about Martha. Um, she's healthy, except that she has asthma and therefore she is not um, completely, she's not warranted as completely sound and healthy because she has asthma. Interesting. Yes. Runaway slave ads, which can be found in many of the um, newspapers that we have available to us now, give a plethora of information about formerly enslaved people, 
they tend to describe them down to the nubs of their knuckles, any markings on their bodies, their height, their weight, um, their skin color, what kind of hair they have, often some things about their personality. See, you can see here, this person has a low and soft manner of speech. Um, if, you know, if you find this to be one of your ancestors, I know that I do not have any pictures of any of my enslaved ancestors. So if I were to find something like this and know that it was my ancestor, because the owner's name is always on here also, I would at least be able to get a mental picture of what that ancestor looks like. Uh, here you have someone, you have his height. You know that he's dark skinned, he's heavy in the chest, so he must be kind of stocky. Um, that's just giving me information that I would not have without, since I don't have a picture of my ancestor. Now, church records, um, they have turned out to be a place where you can find information about the enslaved. Also, as well, you can find information about free people of color because they are usually denoted as such in the church records. It'll say, you know, free man or free woman of color. Uh, this particular record, um, I know you probably can't read it that well, but this is from the Episcopal Church in Lewisburg, North Carolina, where I actually found records about my ancestors who had come to Franklin County to get away from the uh, war-torn area of Washington County where they lived on Somerset Place. Uh, this is the plantation that Dorothy Redford Spruill or Dorothy Spruill Redford wrote about with Somerset Homecoming. And just in the last couple of years, I have found out that my mother's maternal side came from, I'm sorry, my mother's paternal maternal side came from. And so um, this is relatively new research for me, but I have found um, that in Franklin County, when they were at Hurry Scurry, which is another plantation they came to during the war, about 300 of Josiah Collins' enslaved population was brought to Franklin County, North Carolina. And because of his piety, they connected with the Episcopal Church while they were in Franklin County. And therefore they are included in the church registers from the St. Paul Episcopal Church in Lewisburg, North Carolina. And wow. I took this, it's amazing. I took this from my own research. So it has, the reason it has these little blue dots on it is because these are my family members where you see the little blue dots. And these are records of deaths and burials of Josiah Collins. You can see right here, servants of, Miss, of the late Josiah Collins. These people all died during that year or two. I think it was about two years that they were in Franklin County at Hurry Scurry. That's the name of the plantation. You can see where people are buried. All of these were buried at Hurry Scurry. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find the location of where Hurry Scurry was in Franklin County just yet. I wonder if anybody, now this is, I totally do not know the answer to this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if anybody is keeping any kind of registry of the plantations, the names of the plantations and where they were. Yes, um, there's, you can Google that as a matter of fact, and uh, just Google North Carolina plantations. And there's a great document that it's being kept for that. And it's also found on the North Carolina Gen Web. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now this church record that you found, where did you find it? This one is available through Family Search. Really? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I was thinking that maybe you found it on the North Carolina archives, but okay. No, this is through, this one was through Family Search. And you know, um, I have to hand it to Family Search. You never know what you're going to find. About. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. You go to the catalog and put your location in, and you'll be surprised some of the things that will come up. So, and this is for a whole big, you know, uh, there's pages and pages. So, this was eye opening to me because I'm a Baptist and I'm, I'm not really familiar. Well, I am now, but I wasn't really familiar with the way Episcopalians. Um, the process that they go through, which is, I guess, almost exactly like the Catholics with baptism and confirmation and first communion and all the, the, all the things, okay? So the Episcopal Church does the same thing and the enslaved population did every single one of those things. 
So for my ancestors who came from Somerset, Somerset, I now have records of their their birth, their baptism, their first communions when they became communicants, I think is how it's said, Um, their death and their burial, because I also have, thanks to a cousin of mine who brought it to my attention, I also have the registers from the Lake Chapel at Somerset, as well as one of the churches in Edenton that the family belonged to. Good job. And they're all recorded, all of the enslaved population. Okay. Oh, that is That's fantastic. <laughs> so I'm, I'm making myself stop there, even though there are a zillion and one other things you can do to find information about the enslaved. But again, I wanted to kind of keep it at the beginning level A few things. Maybe there could be some intermediate researchers who, who have missed some of those things, but just know there's so much more. And I want to just spend the next few minutes talking about a few of the things that are you're more likely to find uh, some information about free people of color ancestors that you may have had. And so one thing is that free people of color were required to have something that proved that status, and it needed to be something that came from the county government. So this could have been manumission papers if they had been formally enslaved, certificates of freedom, court records, or sometimes what you see here called a freedom badge. This one is from Charleston, South Carolina. If a free person of color was caught without proof of their free status, they could be abducted and enslaved. And there are lots of records uh, of that happening. And one place, uh, something I didn't even put in this presentation I should have, are the um, slave narratives. Because in the slave narratives, many of the interviewees told about the fact that their families had been free, and they told where they lived free, and how they were abducted, and how they were brought back or brought into slavery for the very much like the Solomon Northup story. It really, really happened. It happened to someone on my tree who's a collateral uh, relative. That um, is heartbreaking. It is. So it was important that they had these types of documentation on them. And a lot of these different types of documents, documents are extant and we can find them and learn from them today. Now, another very valuable uh, or one of the very valuable record sets for free people of color have to do with this apprenticeship records. Now I use North Carolina here as an example to teach about apprentice apprenticeships and apprentice records. You will need to go to whatever state your ancestors are in to see what the laws were. But what you're gonna see here about North Carolina was very common. It's only gonna be a tiny little variation from state to state. So North Carolina law provided for binding out as apprentices, all free base born children, including children of color, all minor children whose fathers deserted their families and had been absent for one year, all orphans whose estates were so small that they would not cover the child's education and maintenance, and any child for whom the application was made to the wardens of the poor. Now, the law also provided for apprenticeship of all the children of free Negroes and mulattoes where the parents of such children were not gainfully employed. And I quote, gainfully employed. So this means that it's very subjective for someone to decide whether you're gainfully employed or not. So the snippet that I have here is um, a very nice transcription that's done on the North Carolina Gen website for Tarot County, North Carolina. And here you see Morning Hill, an orphan mulatto girl, and her brother, Charlton Hill, an orphan mulatto boy, who were apprenticed on the same day, April 30th, 1800, by a man named Laban Heyman. Now, Charlton Hill is my third great grandfather who was born free and all of his family, all of his descendants after him were born free. He was born to a white mother named Cecilia Hill and I do not yet know who his father was. Um, What's interesting is that the apprenticed 
children or people, because you could be older and be apprenticed too, were supposed to be taught to read and write. And they were also supposed to be taught a particular trade or skill. A lot of the conversation that I've been having with some uh, other researchers is when you see that there's no particular trade or skill that they're being required to be taught, I believe that's often indicative of a familial relationship. Either they're his children or they're his grandchildren or something like that. But I can't prove that. It's just something that I've been discussing with some people. And I have found um, that in both of the cases, because Laban Heyman dies a few years later and they go to someone else. And when they go to the next person, he didn't have to, to teach them anything either. I think it's kind of a hint that this must be a family member, but I don't know that. But you can see that the one that's for some reason listed between them, Dorcas Poole, apprenticing Hager Neal, an orphan girl, that she is to be taught the skill of a seamstress. Interesting. Another type of document that you will often find free people of color on were bastardy bonds. Now, the purpose of bastardy bonds was to place the responsibility of support for an illegitimate child upon the father, should the mother be or become unable to provide proper uh, support. Otherwise, the child would become a ward of the county poorhouse, which would be an expense to the county, and nobody wanted that. So you can actually find examples like actual copies of bastardy bond documents but I chose instead to put an example from a newspaper because often these bonds were um, reported in the newspaper. Uh, this one is from Wheeling, West Virginia, and it says Charles Meyer was arrested yesterday and taken before Squire Cloen, charged on the oath of Augusta Wenzel, and that's the mother, with being the father of her child, born 27th of May. So you have a a date of birth, you have a mother's name, you have a father's name. Uh, he gave bail in the sum of $400 to appear before the circuit court forthwith to abide the action of the court in the premises. Now, in my Free People of Color talk, I spend like probably six or seven slides on this one topic because there's a very specific order that it goes in, an uh, order of... Um, serving the man and then there's particular steps he has to go through with the court and he has to have people that put up bond for him and all of that so I spend quite a bit of time explaining this but you will find your free people of color listed in these bastardy bonds. Newspapers. So um, free people of color were citizens. They interacted with the courts, with businesses, with each other in exactly the same way whites did. And therefore many accounts of their lives are recorded in newspapers. Um, also uh, the ever increasing laws that were put into place to kind of curtail the freedoms of free people of color resulted in newsworthy events. Because if they broke those laws or if they were accused of breaking their laws, it would usually show up in the newspaper. So here's an example from New Orleans. Um, someone named William Hendricks, identified as a free man of color, was tried at his own request and sentenced to pay a fine of 20, I don't know if that's dollars or pounds, I think it's dollars, for beating another, another free man of color. On the same day, a Jesse Thompson from Nashville was robbed of $1,970 at a gambling house. So that just happened to be in the same piece from the newspaper. At the bottom, the house took up on its last reading a bill for the benefit of Ira Tyler, a free man of color, authorizing him to prove his accounts by his own oath. Mr. Watkins called from the yeas for the yeas and nays, and the question being taken, the bill was rejected, 10 to 26. And I forgot to put the citation. I believe that one was from Ohio. So stuff. if you have a newspaper uh, uh, .com account, or if you're using uh, Chronicling America or whatever newspaper site you're using, put in quotes, free man of color, get, you're going to get thousands of articles, put free woman of color, you're going to get thousands of honor articles, put free person of color, and you're going to get thousands of articles. 
just interesting reading and then you can narrow it down by location. I've noticed yeah. in researching on um, family search and ancestry too, um, if you just simply search the terms African American history or, you know, I mean, you get, you get different results for every different term you try and search. Yes. yes. And I really have been saying for a while that I need to keep a, back to the notebook again. I need to keep a just a running list of all the different terms I have already searched because, you know, now I'm trying to get more and more creative and come up with new terminology that's going to land me some different results. And it's hard to, I know I'm going back and doing things that I've already searched before because I'm like, oh, I already have that, I already have that. So, but we're wrapping up here. Um, what else can you do in researching these ancestors of color? Well, you can use online resources and social media to connect with descendants of slave owning families, as well as with other researchers. Someone may have personal documents related to your ancestors in their possession. You can reach out on Facebook, Twitter, uh, through the messaging on DNA testing sites. There are DNA surname projects that you connect, can connect with, as well as reconciliation projects. Um, I have been doing that for years and have made connections with so many descendants of the different of my different ancestors, both black and white. And every time I meet someone new, I learn something new. This picture was taken several years ago with um, Charles Yarborough, an attorney who was a descendant of my great grandfather's, the family of my great grandfather's last owner. He wasn't a direct descendant of the owner. The actual owner didn't have any children. He didn't have any descendants. But connecting with other researchers leads to valuable information. It helps keep everyone involved. It helps everyone involved. You must be open and willing to share information and share resources and just withhold judgment. And remember that nobody living today enslaved your ancestors. So, you know, and if you're on the other side of that, I have a whole talk about this too. You know, please don't come in with guilt or, you know, feelings of guilt or shame because those of us who descend from the enslaved, we know that you did not enslave our ancestors. I wanted to just touch right back really quickly on the idea of creating a timeline for your ancestors. This is my, this is, well, this is just one, the top part of my running timeline for my great grandfather, Calvin Yarborough Sr., who was born in 1839 and he was enslaved. And every time I find out something new about him, all I have to do is go to the spot chronologically, put my cursor in, click it and type the new information. And so by doing this, you end up painting a picture and telling the story of your ancestor's life without even realizing it. So just to review, when researching ancestors of color, begin with what you know. This could be names, dates, places, anything. Begin to build a tree and or a pedigree chart. Obtain vital data first and mine those documents for the additional information they provide like parents, names and birth locations and all of that. Choose your fork in the road for pre-1870 research and use online and in-person researchers to search for the documents. Make sense of what you see. Use census records and other data wisely. Make note of who lives with and around your ancestor. Record the names of any nearby families who have the same surname and pay attention to who is signing documents as witnesses study the laws of the time, make connections with descendants and other researchers, and remember to create a timeline for your ancestor. This will help you write a story of each of your ancestors' life, lives. These are just some, <laughs> just a few of the resources available for uh, researching ancestors of color. And I, I put the lucky you star because, you know, when I started in the 90s, None of this stuff was online, you know, it was all in-person research. And now the very documents that I found, you know, by going to the courthouses, going to the archives, going to the cemeteries, whatever, they're all online for you. Now, only about 10 to 15% of what's available is online, but those beginning types of documents that I had to find in person, those are online. 
Uh, you can find them, of course, at Ancestry and at Family Search online. Also, I recommend the Digital Library on American Slavery. You can see those petitions that I was talking about, records of the Freedmen's Bureau, the Southern, Southern Claims Commission. Those are just a few of the top ones for online research. And then depending on what, on what a location has digitized, some of this could be online or you would need to go in person to the courthouse, the state archives, uh, vital statistics, you check family Bibles, plantation records, probate rec records, which I showed you how rich those are and those runaway slave uh, advertisements. We're running long, so I'm not gonna read all of this, but just a couple of additional free online sites that will help you jump jumpstart your research would be Afrogenius, which is at afrogenius.com. Cindy's List, go to the African-American category, uh, cindyslist.com, and the, the U.S. Gen Web, which has a site for every county in every state in the United States of America. That site is run by volunteers. It is continuously, all the sites are continuously updated. So I really uh, hope you'll go there. And thank you, Connie, so much for having me, for giving me this opportunity to share. And I just hope everyone will have a nice day. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that, was, that was fabulous. So I know that you spent the summer working on a whole series uh, of North Carolina uh, videos. You want to talk about that for a moment? Sure. Um, my co-host and I, my friend Tania Kuntz and I decided uh, to do this little thing over the summer. Um, it was something I had been thinking about doing for a while. And once I had the idea to reach out for a co-host in Tania, that's really what made it get rolling because I just couldn't seem to make it happen by myself. But um, what we did is we did um, a series of YouTube shows uh, over the course of the summer on the first and third Saturday of each month where we brought in uh, nationally known speakers who have a focus on North Carolina research. And we examined uh, many facets of, of the types of documents that are available for North Carolina research and the good methodology, methodologies to use when researching. So we had, you know, we had Ari Wilkins, we had um, uh, Judy Russell, now I've started name calling and I'm not gonna remember every name uh, who we had. Uh, we had uh, uh, Diane, uh, AC Richard, uh, we had someone from the State Archives of North Carolina. We just brought them in. Originally, Tania and I were going to do the presentations. And we said, no, let's bring people in who are already doing this, who, you know, who yeah. we didn't, it's free. And we didn't yeah. pay anybody. So we just wanted people to be able to grab a presentation that they already had. But as it turned out, people made presentations just for us. Um, these are wonderful. There's a, a show on birth records, marriage records, death records, uh, using the archives. There's a show on using manuscript collections. There's a DNA show with uh, genetic genealogist Shannon Christmas. We would love for people to go back, even if you don't have North Carolina research, to go back and check out those episodes. There is really great information there for everyone. And I don't even think I said this, the name of the show is Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. And all you have to do is Google it. It is on YouTube. You'll, you'll love it. You'll love it. It's yep. wonderful. I think on YouTube, uh, is it North Carolina Summer Series? Summer Series, yes. Yeah. No, North Carolina Summer Series 2020, I think it is, dot com. Yeah. Boy, you guys were so prepared and oh man, really great episodes. So uh, for those of you who want to check that out, um, there it goes kind of beyond the North Carolina borders, though. There's just a lot of good quality genealogy information in there. Very much so. Very much so. Lady, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we're going to you. you back again. I hope so. Have a really great day. Thank All you. Right, thank you. All right. Well, we want to thank Renata for us. Uh, spending the time to share with us her knowledge. If you want to learn more about Renata Yarborough Sanders and what she's got going on, I'll leave several links in the description box below this video. All right, it is time for you to go find your ancestors. So until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.